uh, yeah, thanks, Tobias, for some of the introduction to the terminologies that uh, we will use, and uh, so that some of it a bit overlaps. Uh, myself, I'm Shrikant Thakde. I work at IBM, and my colleague Shrikar will be joining remotely. So we'll get started on this, and so we'll specifically talk about using for a dynamic update of CPU capacity based on the steal time. We'll go through the problem statement and the micro benchmark results that we see, and then we'll see what are the current approaches the Linux uh, kernel has, and uh, we'll see why CPU capacity may be one of the right approach. That is what I would like to get a feedback from here, you know, whether it's the right approach or not. And then if it is the right approach, how to do it? We, we are stumbling upon some of the issues in load balancer. Are we, you know, which direction that we will take or which is the right probably better way to go about it? That's what I would like to get feedback on. And that's with that, let's get started. So the problem in the, in the problem statement is same, like we have an overcommit LPARs, that is, or, or VMs, I may use LPAR or VM interchangeably, they mean the, they both mean the same thing. So I have multiple such VMs and all the VMs, uh, vCPUs combined. So yeah, uh, some of all the vCPUs combined in all, all VMs exceeds the physical CPU present in the system. That's, that's the definition of overcommit. And when in such scenarios, when all the VMs start using the same uh, uh, workload or the they're running at the same time, that's when we start seeing the vCPU preemption, right? And in general, uh, I think this applies to all architectures that, you know, vCPU preemption is costlier than the task switch. That is, preemption in the host is costlier than the preemption in the guest, right? And, but the thing is, it gets kind of aggregate, I mean, aggregated by the core scheduling. The reason being, for example, PowerVM host implement uh, core scheduling. Uh, so we will be asking for more cores. You may not be scheduling on so many vCPUs, but you will end up asking, uh, based on the logical pinning of the core, you will end up asking for more cores, and that kind of you know ma makes it problem even worse. So the four diagrams here quickly. The first two are the good scenarios because either one VM is using or both the VMs are using, but relatively less. Third is the problem statement that you know that we see the vCPU preemption there, and fourth is something that we we think it's the right way or we think it's a probably better way to do this. You know, instead of running on all the five cores, probably limit your workload onto let's say two or three cores which underlying hardware can uh, satisfy. So this, this is some of the micro benchmark results that we see. I have two VMs here. They both have 94 cores, uh, vCPUs, and uh, they, they both have 47 entitled cores. So what I mean by entitled core is, these are the number of cores that hypervisor is bound to give you irrespective of the scenario. I, be their contention or no contention, you are guaranteed to get th those many cores. So uh, in, in all these numbers that you see on the right side, note that both the VMs are running the same workload at the same time. And the first set of numbers that you see in each bracket there is the default behavior that is be spread across all the vCPUs. And second set of numbers, you see we are doing a task set. So we are limiting the workload to certain number of CPUs. They may not be the best ideal this CPU scenarios, but we want to validate whether this idea works. And we see good improvement in uh, um, micro benchmarks. We came here after validating this does help with your enterprise workloads, you know, to a certain, like it's not as significant as micro benchmarks, but it is like uh, mid uh, uh, high in single digit numbers, right? So what are the design requirements of this? We, this? This can happen often, and this can happen at runtime, so it has to be a lightweight framework to do this. And it, in the, when there's no contention, uh, vCPU, all the uh, VM can make use of all the resource it can, and it should dynamically restrict the workload when there is a contention, right? So these are some of the current approaches that we have. We have CPU hot plug. We can online or offline the CPUs as we deem fit, but this is disruptive and it is expensive to do so. It takes at least a couple of seconds on a like uh, nine, 1920 CPU system to do a single hot plug operation, right? Uh, so it is disruptive and it will, it's not a built-in kernel mechanism like I need to do some kind of a daemon or a script which can online or offline the CPUs, right? And then we have CPU set which can do similar thing. It can, you know, it's more efficient than hot plug. Uh, we can write a you know, script which can uh, go ahead and set the CPU sets accordingly based on the underlying uh, symptoms that we see, for example, we see the steal time, then we go and update. But it's, again, it's not a built-in kernel mechanism, and I think it will become 
more difficult to maintain it per se because we'll have different architectures and then we'll have different scenarios under which this has to work. And then lastly, we have ASIM packing. Uh, this is this currently quite tailored to ITMT and Power7 because those are the two major architectures that are using it. And doing, doing this for this purpose will make it more complicated and it needs a scared domain rebuild uh, when we are you know, changing the dynamic scenario. So that scared domain rebuild is again costly. So then last approach, except the scared EXT, <laughs> we that we evaluated is CPU capacity as a framework. Uh, so with so with advantage that we get is a uh, fair bit of code is already there, which uh, you know the scheduler expects uh, to move the task from high, you know, when there's a low capacity and high capacity CPUs based on the task load, scheduler moves uh, some of the task from low capacity to high capacity CPUs automatically. So we thought, you know, let's make make use of it and it is very lightweight to do so. Let's change it to one, what happens? You know, just give it a try. So we just, uh, I have for example here, like uh, I'm using number of CPUs. Initially I'm using the debug, debug, debug FS file to set the absolute value, which I think, you know, let's say in the previous I had 752 CPUs, right? For example, I say set it to 376, does the current Linux scheduler go and run all the threads within those number of CPUs, right? So then how we will use steal time? Uh, the steal time is an indication that when there is a contention, that means if I am observing significant high steal time, that means there's a vCPU contention. So I'm, I have a very simple approach here. And then let's say if I'm observing steal time, I'm going to reduce the number of cores that I will use by one. And if I, have, I don't have much of a steal time, then I increase the number of cores that I can use by one. Then advantage that we can have with this is it can be done in a very arc dependent way. It need not be done in the, because doing the, this in a generic uh, scheduler code will be very tricky to do so. And for example, uh, as Tobias was saying, in the S390, it slightly differs from architecture to architecture how, how, it, how it's done, right? Or how, then the architecture can de decide which CPUs as well, because that will become very, very tricky. For example, I think x86 CPU numbers are in different way, in power PC it's in a different way. So if we, use this kind of an approach where it is arc dependent, arc can decide how to set, let's say if, if it observes steal time, it can do it in its own way, right? So does it work? Some, like let's say we do this, does it work? So at least, at least setting the CPU capacity seems to work fine. We am, I, am, I am able to see it in the, with the help of a debug FS file and the uh, capacity flags work too. I don't know if I'm going too quickly, okay? So this is what I want, you know, this is in a subsequent slide, I want to have a discussion on this and we'll get started on that. So if on the left side, I have an upstream kernel where I don't change any capacity. All the capacities are default values and you can see the workload spreads to all the CPUs. This is the de default behavior that we get with the kernel. And then on the uh, right side top, I have CPU capacity set to one for CPU greater than 376. I see some kind of packing happens there, but it's not the behavior that I want. For example, I, some tasks are running on like say 380 CPU still. They are low capacity, but they're still running the majority of the workload. For example, if you see slightly above, for example, 370 is not running anything. That, that is strange, and that's what we some of the this load balancer issues that we'll discuss next. We made some of those changes, some, of, some may be controversial, but that's, this is some of the, the observation that we did. So with those changes, we are able to see, you know, it kind of all the high capacity CPUs run the workload, low capacity don't run anything. This is something that we would like to achieve. So, yeah, yeah. So, I, just so I understand, you're, you're saying that uh, above 376, you've, you've forced the capacity to one as a, as a hack, right? And you're still seeing 80, 90%? Yeah, this is, this is strange because, for example, if you see here, 377 have capacity one, but they are running the workload, and 36, for example, this does it? Yeah, in fact, okay. This is 
not what I was expecting uh, because there is low capacity CPU running the workload, but high capacity is not running anything. But she, but she said in the th third quadrant, it looks yeah. like it is working. Yeah, th that is the, the changes that I'm going to talk next. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, th these, the these, these are some yeah. of the things that probably causes all this. So, so we'll go through that. For example, when we are picking the busiest SCED group in the update as we pick busiest, we will honor the CPU capacity, asymmetric CPU capacity yeah, we'll honor the asymmetric CPU capacity only if uh, local group is group has pair. Otherwise, we'll skip that group. But in this case, even if local group, let's say, is slightly busy or even overloaded, we want to pull it from the low capacity CPU regardless. Okay, that's one. And second and third are the bit interesting ones. Uh, I don't know why the second one is that way. For example, I, what I observe is task fit CPU returns true even though capacity is one in some cases, not all the cases, some cases it returns true. This happens because the task util estimate function that we use returns zero. Zero, yeah. which is normal because with the utilization, the new utilization. But task, it is a CPU in that run queue has a task running. And the CPU has a task running. Yeah, yeah, I, it's there in the trace. Okay. I, uh, um. Yeah, kind of tangential point. I don't know why it's not working here, but have you tried faking the steel time as if it's a thermal pressure inside the VM? Steel so time make it act as if you're having thermal throttling inside the VM. No. If you try that, will it just work? Especially my question. Yeah, in fact, it's no more only thermal. We have now a system pressure in the scheduler where you can update the CPU capacity with that. Yeah. The, the thing is, like, if CPU capacity has to work for this, right? Like, yeah. let's yeah. say by some means, for example, here we are using the steel time just to set the CPU capacity. Similar, like thermal pressure also, we, we'll in the end of the day, we'll set the CPU capacity. But just setting the CPU capacity to such a low value doesn't itself work, then the rest of the framework will not work, right? I guess my question is really, I don't know what else setting that. Like the, the API that you call to set the system capacity or thermal capacity, is it doing the necessary rebalancing? It, it does. For example, if you set the thermal pressure, like subsequently CPU capacity gets reduced, and we expect the load balancer to use the group misfit load to pull the workload if the scheduler domain has scheduler set domain has set. set capacity set. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think that the load balancer has been fully validated with SMT and ASIM capacity as far as I know because uh, no, the existing platforms that have ASIM capacity don't have SMT, so that that may be a factor. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. That's that's probably true. Yeah, just uh, just uh, up on following up on. Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I can. Following can up you hear me? The, okay. The, following up on the. On the, the um, Ricardo, can you mute, please? I'm mute. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just following up on, on the point from Saravana. So I think we already have support for reducing the capacity using the PV steel time tough. That looks like IRQ pressure or something like that in the scheduler, but that means I think your hypervisor needs to support that. Is, do you have support for that in your hypervisor? Uh, come back to that maybe offline. Yeah. I don't think we have that. Yeah, but still, and then you just need to turn that on, and then if you have, if your hypervisor reports steel time to the guest, then that should reduce your capacity, yeah, that, just like that, IRQ exactly pressure. Done, yeah. that, hypervisor so. is reporting the CPU. I mean, the steel time is reported by the hypervisor. Okay. Yeah. As in, we, okay. Yeah, yeah, in but, PowerVM, we see the, for example, if you see in that, this one, no, this diagram here, uh, you see the, the, I think I don't know which number, the, the below the steel time, you see subsequently steel time being reported. We see, mid-digit number of steel time equal to the user time because there are two VMs, they're running this. Actually, the CPU, the steel time is more there, but it, it's like equal to the user time. That's kind of an indication that, you know, there is equal amount of user time, equal amount of steel time. That's because there are two VMs running the same workload at the same time in a same configuration way, right? Your system, you, you have a, a SMT? SMT8. Okay, two, so yeah. I'm not sure that all the... Um, ASIM capacity, I'm not sure that this have been fully tested with the SMTK. So maybe that's why yeah. sometimes 
the test fit CPU can return, or you can have some okay. corner case with SMT. We never test that with SMT, to be honest. Okay. okay. I'll so maybe it's a matter of finding the, the use case which are not uh, covered yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Yeah. So the next one is interesting because we recently added this group SMT balance. And I don't think we had a system at that time which kind of use case for this. But what I see is, you know, a lot of time I, ha I see the group uh, has a misfit task load being set as well as group SMT balance being set. And since SMT balance is a higher priority than this, so it doesn't do the balancing in the subsequent slide, in the subsequent stage because they both are SMT anyway, right? And then uh, this all works fairly well when there's a, you know, the concurrency is low, but when concurrency gets to beat high levels, I see then this group overload has a more priority. So I just made group uh, misfit as a highest priority to handle the high concurrency cases. And then last one, fifth one is similar to two. So we'll skip that. So sixth one is that CP check CPU capacity. It's, it's an indication that CPU capacity has been reduced due to deadline or RT, but doesn't mean for this use case because we are reducing the capacity by ourselves, right? So what are no, the- No, but, but if you put, if you use the, the hardware pressure, system pressure, then you will, f uh, the check CPU capacity, take that into account. Whereas if you s uh, reduce directly the CPU capacity, mm -hmm. it's not okay. a reduced, uh, the, yeah. I mean, okay. it's, it's yeah. new max capacity. Okay, okay. Yeah. So the, the, the feedback that I wanted to get here is whether, let's say, we think CPU capacity may be the right way to do. If, if so, what are the approach that we can take in load balancer? Either we can introduce a new group type to do this, because otherwise we have to use continue using misfit task load, which is designed to move that uh, task based on the CPU capacity, and then ensure that it doesn't break the regular uh, big little topology cases, right? The bigger question that is, uh, is the CPU capacity itself is, is the right framework to do this? Because it has its own advantages, but it also has some disadvantages. Because it's lightweight, it is kernel, built in kernel mechanism to do so. But uh, yeah, uh, and it doesn't need a domain rebuilding, but only the main cons that I see is uh, in a very high concurrency case, we might still spill over and yeah, we might still spill over and then that may not work. And the deadline and RT doesn't honor the CPU capacity, as far as I'm aware. And, but it may not be the concern because I don't think anyone expects to run on such system because they're not deterministic anyway for the workload, right? Yeah, that's pretty much I had. And this is, yeah, that's it. <laughs>